Hello and welcome to this tutorial on how to make a setup on a Seto Corso Competizioni. Now, um, a few people in the community and a few comments on YouTube have uh, asked me, you know, how do you make a good setup for, for, for a car? Now, I'm not expert into making a setup, but uh, I know quite a bit of, you know, how to make a decent setup. So this isn't for, you know, someone that already is good at making setups. This is for the beginners. It's, it's a beginner tutorial on how to make a setup on a car so I'm not only going to show you you know how to make one I'm going to show you how you um, you know look for things of ways to improve a setup um, and I'll go through uh, what different parts of the setup mean because I know that you know if you're not fully into engineering or racing as uh, as much or if you're new to it and um, some of the words and stuff you don't really know what they mean it looks quite confusing uh, so yeah, so this video is a beginner's tutorial on how to make a good setup on a set of Corsa Competizione. So without further ado, we'll jump into it. And what I'll first start with is what the different parts of the setup mean. And then I'll do some laps and um, show you what to look out for and uh, how you change um, setups and uh, what feedback you need to try and collect when you're driving a car to get... Um, decent setup so let's get straight into it so we'll go single player um, I go just into practice and it can be anything uh, select uh, we'll do Barcelona because I've just done that track so it'll be interesting my car weather um, doesn't really matter um, I might do a wet setup in a separate video or maybe at the end of this video because wet setups obviously different because obviously you have to try and tailor it to the wet so this one's gonna be mainly about dry setup so say I'll just do clear and we will jump straight into this practice session so you'll get to this screen obviously um, and obviously you go to setups and uh, first things first is to load the aggressive preset setup um, the aggressive one is better than the safe setup. Uh, obviously the safe one's more stable. If you're brand new to the game, maybe use the safe one at first. Um, but the aggressive setup is already pretty good. And then what I tend to use is I grab the aggressive one and then make tweaks to it to, um, to make it better. So we'll go on the aggressive setup and obviously you won't make any changes. The first things that I'm gonna do is uh, talk through what everything does and what everything means. So the first screen is tires. So on tires, you have obviously the left front, the right front, right rear, and left rear. So the first thing you get shown is PSI. Now PSI is the measurement of um, tire pressure. Um, so the perfect PSI is between 27 and 28. And um, that doesn't mean go and shove it on 27, between 27 and 28, because your pressures will change um, based on on the track temperature and uh, you know which what kind of track it is like Barcelona is notorious for wearing your left uh, side because it has a lot of right hand turns so as you can see up here on the top right 31 degrees C outside and the tracks 40 degrees C um, so when it's hotter your pressures increase faster uh, the default here I think was on 25 25.1 26.3 26.4 obviously I'm not gonna make any changes yet because um we'll do that later in the video but to explain yeah so this is tire pressures you want them to be between 27 and 28 when driving that is the optimal um pressure for your tires and the readings obviously are all on zero because i haven't driven yet but when you drive these will have readings so omi stands for outside middle inside so that's the three sections of the tires the outside of the tire the middle of the tire and the, out and the inside of the tire and um, this is temperatures so um, when you come out of the pits, your tires will automatically be on 70 because in GT3 racing, uh, you get tire blankets that can heat up to a max of 70 degrees C. So these will naturally be 70. And uh, while you're driving around, they obviously change. The optimal temps for tires is between 70 and 90. That's when they have optimal grip. Um, and then when you come back in, you'll see the difference in temperatures uh, when they're worn and that's um, another indication of whether you should change things. Um, so the, the, the key thing from tire temperatures is 
you don't want, especially on the front, you don't want the difference between outside and inside to be more than nine. So if this is 90 and this is 99, then that's just on the limit of a good difference. Um, and then you'll have to change things like camber and toe just to, you know, change that um, to make sure. But on the front, you don't want the difference between the outside and the inside to be more than nine degrees. On the back, you don't want it to be more than five. Uh, so overheating tires, I'll show you what different tires will look like on the screen now. So you'll see that um, blue is when they're really, really cold. Now these are extremes of each situation. Uh, green is when they're perfect. And red is when they're really overheating. And normally you'll see the more like the rear tires here where they're yellow, um, which is when they're overheating. Next thing we move on to is toe. What is toe? Now toe is the distance between the front of the tires to the back of the tires. I'll put a diagram on the screen and you can see what toe is. So you have toe in, which is where the front of the tires are closer than the back. And you have toe out, which is where the back of the tires are closer than the front. Toe out is negative and toe in is positive. Too much toe in can cause a lot of um, understeer and too much toe out can cause can, call, can cause a lot of oversteer. So if we look here, I have uh, minus 0.1 and minus 0.1 on the front, and then 0.15, 0.15 on the rear. On the front, you almost always have negative toe. Uh, it just um, ha makes the car turn in better, because uh, you want the front end of the car to be very responsive. You want it to turn in really well. Um, now this is for the Bentley, it's different obviously for different cars, especially for cars that are mid-engined or rear-engined, like the, the Audis, the Lambos, the Porsche that's rear-engined. Uh, I've mostly driven the Bentley or the Mercedes that are both front-engined, so things do uh, change a bit for rear-engined cars. Um, but on the Bentley and the Mercedes, normally a negative toe on the front is always very good to get it turned in. On the rear, you never want negative toe. Um, if you have negative toe on the rear, you've done, gone wrong somewhere, uh, the car will be pretty much undrivable. You always want positive toe on the rear. Uh, next, we have camber. So if toe was the difference between, the distance between the front of the tires to the back, that's when looking down. Um, camber is when you're looking straight on of the car. Again, I'll put an example on the screen. Um, so positive camber is when the top of the tire is leaning out and the bottom is leaning in and negative camber is when the top is leaning in and the bottom is leaning out now you'll see things like negative camber if you know into cars like stanced cars and stuff where you see the tires are ridiculously pointed out now that's to an, again to an extreme like the diagrams I'm showing um, whereas obviously it's less extreme in racing because you still want the car to be drivable in racing you almost always use negative camber uh, because negative has much greater stability because you have a wider stance which obviously means more grip however negative camber is also much more um, grippy which means much more tire wear you get a lot more tire wear on negative camber now you almost always have negative camber but it's how negative you have it obviously the more negative the more grippy but the more tire wear a lot of the time and that is uh, camber next we have caster now, caster is the third angle, so toe is looking down, camber is looking straight on at the tyre, and caster is looking from the side. Again, I'll put an example of what caster is. And caster is really the angle that the steering axis, axis is at uh, with respect to the vertical axis uh, when looking at the car from the side. So if the steering axis is back, it's positive caster. Um, so this means that the axis in which you rotate is actually in front of the of the tire's contact patch on the ground. So when you turn the wheel, the, the tire tries to straighten out um, and the wheel kind of like trails behind it. Um, you, you, you will see this all the time, positive caster, because negative caster is very unstable because the turning axis is behind the contact patch so it's not very uh, stable. So you always have positive caster. Um, a prime example of where you'll see positive caster in the real world, that where you can physically see it, um, is in like office chairs or even shopping carts. Um, pretty sure most of you either have an office chair or been shopping with a shopping cart, where you'll see the you can actually buy them. They're called casters. The bit that sits where the wheel is, it's always um, it's 
So I was behind. Um, uh, in front, sorry. Um, because the wheels will trail behind the steering axis. You're, if you're pushing a shopping cart, the wheels are always behind the, the, the caster that comes down. So it makes it very responsive, you know, when you're pushing an office chair, you can move it around really easily, you can move shopping carts around really easily. So this is kind of a less extreme version of it where you have the caster uh, in positive because it makes the car a lot more responsive and turns a lot better. So that is caster. So those are the sections on tires. We'll go over them in a more detail. That's what they mean. Uh, we'll go over what they do uh, when we do some setup um, runs and tests. Next is electronics. Uh, electronics, there's really um, three things you need to know. Traction control, ABS, and ECU map. Telemetry laps is uh, only if you use MoTeC, which I'm not going to go into this video. It's very handy for making setups, uh, but there's lots of videos out there on MoTeC, um, so I'll leave that out. So, traction control. Well, tra traction control is really a system to counteract spinning wheels. Um, really, the higher the traction control, the better, because it's stops the wheel spinning however it does make the car slower slower um, it avoids tire wear and spinning wheels but obviously you get less speed coming out of corner because it, it's cutting um, the tires from spinning uh, some cars have a you'll see on here they'll have a TC2 option uh, the cars with a TC2 uh, it basically de determines how much engine power is cut by the traction control to stop the tires spinning uh, usually if you have a car with TC and TC2, um, you keep them both similar. I know that the Aston had some sort of thing where you could run TC1 on 2 and TC2 on 8, which is vastly different and it worked really well. I don't know if that's still a thing after the 1.8 update. Uh, I don't drive the Aston. Uh, I drove it just before the 1.8 update and that was the kind of uh, uh, setup to have. Uh, so I don't know if that works, but usually you want TC and TC2 to be very similar plus or minus three. So if you have TC on three, TC2 would be on uh, two, three, four, five, you know, something like that. Um, normally traction control is three or four. I'd say, I know some cars like the Mercedes runs on really good high traction control. So you can put it even to like five, even six. But majority of the time it's two, three, four is the way, the area you want to put traction control on. ABS uh, is anti-lock braking system. Um, so the pros of having ABS is that the brakes don't lock, obviously, which means you don't, uh, basically if the brakes lock, your tire stops spinning and that's where you get flat spots. You know, you'll see in racing, whether you watch Formula One or GT3 racing, where the tires stop spinning and lots of smoke comes out and then you get flat spots on the tires. Um, the cons of ABS is obviously the higher the ABS, the longer the braking, because obviously your brakes don't clamp down as hard because um, it stops them from locking. So the higher ABS, the the earlier you have to brake, whereas the lower the ABS, the later you can brake, but you're more likely to lock up your tires. Um, so again, you don't want it on any extreme. You don't want really high ABS. You don't want really low ABS. Um, again, three, four, five, uh, two even, I think you can put ABS on. Again, it's a preference thing of how you drive, the car you're driving. Um, since the new 1.8 update, I know you can run on higher ABS and still uh, be beneficial. So I think on some tracks where I used to run like three or two ABS, I now run four um, because it's 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 still, you can late, brake quite late and it doesn't lock up the tires. So um, that is ABS. Next is ECU maps. Um, so ECU maps is the engine map. The ECU is the computer in the engine. And really the usual rule of thumb is uh, the lower the map number, so one, uh, the faster, but the more fuel usage. And then as you go down, uh, you get more into conserving fuel, but your car's not as quick because it doesn't put out as much power. The Porsche, I think, is one of the outliers that has like the fastest ever engine maps on like eight because it has a quality map. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave a link below to a... Um, table I made with every single car's ECU maps so just find the one for your car and then it will show you on there uh, which engine map does what and um, but on most cars apart from the Porsche number one is the fastest and then number two is normally to save fuel that is ECU next we go on fuel and strategy now fuel and strategy is mostly for when you're doing races where obviously you can adjust the fuel 
uh, just the tires that you have, wet or dry, uh, the tire set you're using, and um, where you can see the wear, the grain, the blisters, the flat spots, the pad wear, the disc wear, a lot of information you need to know, um, and the fuel per lap your car uses. Um, the important thing here is the brakes, which brake set you have. Uh, so I'll go through what the brake sets have. So first one is brake set one. So brake set one is really aggressive, uh, maximum braking performance. Uh, ha that comes with high wear though. Um, so they're high wear, but really, really good brakes. Um, they're not very predictable if they're out of the optimal temp range. So if your brakes are not in the optimal temp range, uh, the braking linearity and modulation can be a bit all over the place. Um, so, you know, you have to try and, you know, uh, have them in the temperature range um, as much as possible. These brakes are the best for races under three hours. So any race under three hours, use brake set one. However, be wary because uh, if you're on a hot track like this one at the moment, which is 40 degrees, your brakes uh, can uh, heat up more and wear quicker. Uh, so it's up to three hours, but you can give or take an hour depending on the track conditions. Uh, we had a race at Barcelona where my team ran brakes at one and my rear brake fails failed on the final lap uh, on the last few corners uh, because it was under three hours it was a two hour 40 minute race but with a lot of heat and lots of braking um you know if we were avoiding someone crashing or something or if we almost spun ourselves we had to hit the brakes hard we obviously wore the brakes more than uh, usual and we had a rear brake failure so yeah so brakes at one up to three hours the best brakes but high wear and for sprint races mostly. Next is brake set two. Uh, the brake set two, uh, really good at braking performance, not as good as brake set one, but still really good, but they're really good at wear. They have really good feedback, very predictable when outside of operating temps, and these can be used in sprint races. You would still be quick with brake set two in sprint races, so anything under three hours. Um, they're still good, but what they're ideal for is endurance races, anything from 4 hours to 12 hours. They can even be used for 24 hour races if you're uh, very good at braking and can look after your brakes. Uh, so these are the best for anything, any type of endurance racing, always stick to brake pad 2. They're really good uh, and they still have very good performance. Next we have brake set three now brake set three uh don't really use them in dry conditions uh because the braking distance is very big you have to brake a lot earlier than you would what these are perfect for is cold and wet conditions if it's raining if it's really cold these brake set these brake pads work beautifully outside of operating temperature which is why heavy rain brake set three cold temperatures and rain brake set three um Brake set three are really good. You can use brake pads two in rain, in light rain, but majority of the time when it's raining, if it's heavier rain and if it's cold temps, uh, brake set three are the best. So these are really good for wet races and also very good for really long endurance races like 24 hour races. The last set you have is brake set four, which are a bit null because they're extremely aggressive, maximum braking performance, but they don't last for more than an hour. Um, if even that, depending on how harshly you brake. So these are uh, really cool outside the operating, uh, operating window. I don't really recommend using brake set 4 unless you're doing like a hot lap mode and you're just doing one hot lap. If you want to get maximum brake performance, do brake set 1. The last longer, the better anyway, and they're pretty much just as good. So yeah, usually you'll use one or two depending on the uh, type of race, whether it's a sprint race or an endurance race. Um, and then if it's raining and cold, you could use brake set 3. Um, could be the option for you, but most of the time, one or two of the ones you'll be using. Next, we're going to mechanical grip. Now, myself, I'm really into cars, so you know, I knew what uh, PSI, tow, camber, caster was, I knew what traction control, ABS, ECU are. I knew a lot of this. Mechanical grip is where certain things I started to look at and be like, what does this mean? You know, anti roll bar, I knew, brake power, brake bias, steer ratio, I knew, but wheel rate, bump stop, bump stop range. What does this all mean? This is where a lot of beginners get even more confused and even people that know quite a bit about cars like myself also get confused. So let's go over what these mean. Anti-roll bar. Now what the anti-roll bar is, is a torsion spring connected, uh, connecting the left and the right side of uh, the chassis. So they go from the left wheel to the right wheel on the front and the rear. And what it does is it prevents chass chassis roll. Uh, so the chassis can't roll as much. Um, if 
you have a bar, kind of a big torsion spring uh, um, holds the two sides together. So you have the front anti-roll bar, which is the one between the two front wheels, and the front anti-roll bar uh, has a big impact on corner entry behavior. If you soften it, which is a lower number, um, you tend to get more corner entry oversteer. And if you stiffen it, which is a higher number, you tend to get more corner entry understeer. So if you have a very oversteer car, you make it up. If you have a very understeery car, you bring it down. Rear anti-roll bar, which is back here, is more on throttle behavior and corner exit. So again, if you have um, a very oversteery car, you will soften it to add more understeer. So it's kind of the opposite. On the front, to over add oversteer, you soften it, whereas on the rear, to add understeer, you soften it. So it's the opposite way around. And then if you stiffen it, which is higher number, you'll add more oversteer, whereas on this one, if you have a higher number, you'll add more understeer. So it's the other way around, because one's on throttle response and corner exit, and one's on corner entry and, um, you know, corner going into the corner. Next we have um, brake power, which is obviously how much the brakes apply when you hit them. So if this is on 100%, if I hit the brakes 100%, they will brake at 100%. If I set it to 98 and I hit the brakes 100%, the brakes will only apply 98%. Usually you never really change it from 100%, you want the maximum braking power. Um, there is certain conditions, I think, where you can use like something like 98, but majority of the time, just leave it on 100%. You don't really play with that that much. Before I go to brake bias, just because it's a longer one, I'll go into steer ratio um, because it's quicker to go over. Steer ratio is basically the degrees you have to turn the steering column for the car's wheel to turn one degree. So even though here it's one number, what it actually is, is it's the number colon one. So this would be 12 colon one. This ratio is 12 to one. So 12 to one means I have to turn the steering wheel 12 degrees for the wheel to turn one degree. Basically a lower number is a more responsive steer ratio so the car is going to be really responsive with like on 10 whereas on like 14 50 obviously i have to turn the wheel more uh, for the wheel to turn one degree which means it's less responsive again steer ratio you don't touch too much and um, if you want a car that's like more responsive you can give it one click down if you want a car that's less responsive it's very twitchy already maybe one click up that's steer ratio so brake bias what is brake bias now brake bias is the distribution of the braking force towards the front wheels or the rear wheels. So 50% is even, so that's 50% of the brake force goes to the front and 50% goes to the rear. Anything over 50% means more of the force goes to the front. Anything less than 50% means more of the force goes to the rear. More force to the front makes the car more stable, but also more understeering, and you usually have to brake earlier. More force to the rear makes the car less stable and more oversteering. Front engine cars, like the Bentley, always have it around 60, like the lowest you can go is 57, but you'll always have it around in the 60s. The ideal for most front engine cars is probably from like 60 to 65, I'd say. Um, that's because obviously you have the engine in the front, so it's more heavy in the front. So to keep it stable, you want most of the brake force to go into the front, which you always have most of the brake force in the front, but obviously you want it even more. So yeah, front engine cars, you always want it between 60 and 65, I'd say. Whereas I think re-engine cars or mid-engine cars like the uh, Audi uh, or the Porsche, which is the rear engine, you can have actually the brake bias a lot lower and a lot more to the rear because obviously you have the engine in the rear. So I think the Porsche having the engine physically right at the back, you can have it all the way down to like 50% or something, I'm pretty sure, like 52. Um, whereas the other mid-engine cars can have it in like 55 to like 59 or something, or to 60 or something. Don't be careful you don't overdo it because obviously if you put your brake bias too low the car the back of the car becomes very very stretchy and very um under understeer uh, oversteery um so yeah so that is brake bias uh next we'll look at the other bit of info on the rear which is the preload differential now a lot of you might know what a differential is uh, the diff is the system that allows the rear wheel the wheels to rotate at different speeds when cornering because obviously the outside, say you have a right-hand turn, the outside wheel, which will be the left, has to travel a lot further than the inside wheel going around the right corner. So the outside wheel has to rotate quicker to keep up with the inside wheel as you're going around the corner. So that's what the differential does. Now, GT3 cars are fixed to homologation. 
so you can't actually change the speed that the diff makes the wheels rotate but what you can change is the preload now the preload is how early the diff opens so the diff opens and that starts making the wheels rotate at a different speed so if you have less, less preload diff the differential will open earlier so at 50 newton meters the preload will open or at 4 newton meters the preload the differential will open will open and that kind of makes the car more agile it makes it a bit more understeering on exit a uh, bit better acceleration a bit more smooth whereas a higher preload uh, means the diff will stay closed for longer during a corner this makes the car more stable on entry but more oversteery on exit how and the throttle linearity and um it's just a lot less smooth um that way most cars will have it quite low um but yeah so if you want to change um the way the the car feels on entry and exit and the way the throttle feels then preload dip is what you want to change however this does differ on different corners so if you're on a corner where you're in a low gear but very high IP rpm um you know so um a, 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 you know a corner where you're on first and second and you're really high rpm um you want to have a different uh diff to a corner that's one of these quick corners that has high gear low rpm so if you're in like fifth gear but you're only like halfway through the rpms um then the, the diff will uh obviously the way it works will be slightly different um normally when you have lower you kind of get more balance off throttle so when you're coasting uh, a lower preload diff will be more balanced but again it's something we'll go into when i'm actually making the setup and that's just the explanation of what preload diff is next we go into the dampers no we don't go into the dampers i was just looking at my notes where i wrote everything down <laughs> and uh i completely forgot to talk about all the wheels the wheel rate the bump stop rate and the bump stop range what does this mean well wheel rate is the force required to compress the suspension um so how do i describe this easier basically you know how much force is required to go through to fully make the suspension squish together uh, heavier cars require stiffer springs obviously because it's a heavier car and front engine cars require a stiffer front spring spring because obviously again the engine and most of the weight of the car is in the front you'll see here on um the bentley it's uh one six hundred sixty thousand i think oh it is yeah one hundred sixty thousand on the front one hundred fifty thousand on the rear because obviously it's slightly stiffer on the front because um the engine on the front so again higher is stiffer and lower is softer um, if your car struggles on slow corners usually you lower the wheel rate to soften it um, because a softer suspension um, will allow the car to get a bit more grip on the low corners and, and you know um, get that grunt out of the corner next is bump stop rate now what is bump up stop rate well basically the bump stop is the locking an elastic locking element above the suspension uh, and this really stops the the suspension from like going at, you know it's the bump stop it stops it from going fully up and basically the bump stop rate represents how stiff the bump stop itself is the stiffer the bump stop the higher and the, the softer the lower uh, so if you have an oversteery car you tend to reduce the bump stop rate and if you have a under steery car you tend to increase the bump stop rate bump stop range is the amount of travel the suspension has before it hits the bump stop so again lower number actually this is lower number for stiffer and a higher number for softer um, on smooth tracks you normally have a lower number you want a stiff um bump stop range um and you want softer springs on bumpy tracks tracks with big curves where you have a higher bump stop range um really the key is trying making the suspension as soft as you can and still drivable a soft suspension is always better but too soft is not good so you kind of want to try and make it as soft as you can and then and then um 
it's, but it's still good to drive. Um, if there's a track with a lot of long corners, long mid-speed, high-speed corners, a high bump stop range is better. Um, because you'll have that really soft, because uh, uh, soft suspension, because it allows the car to turn in, and it allows the front to turn in more. It adds a bit more oversteerer. So, yeah, if you if you have a lot of lot, long corners, if you have an oversteery car, a higher bump stop range is better. Now we can move over to the dampers, which is where I thought we were going to go. I skipped a bit early. So the dampers, you have bump, fast bump, rebound, fast rebound. So as you can see, they're probably all linked in some sort of way. So the bump is the compression of the shock absorbers. So the bump is the speed in which the suspension spring is compressed. So a higher value is a lower speed, so the suspension will compress slowly. Um, and whereas a softer value means the suspension will, a uh, lower value, sorry, will mean the suspension will compress a lot faster. So a higher value is stiffer suspension, um, whereas a lower value is softer suspension because this is how um, the shock absorbers uh, compress the shock. Rebound is the opposite. If bump is the compression, rebound is how the shock, shock absorbers uh, control the speed in which the spring extends, in, which, in the way in which it returns to the normal length. Again, um, a higher value means a slower rebound, which is uh, means it, gets, it takes longer, it's slower to return back to its original state, which means it's stiffer, and um, a lower value is a softer, so it means the suspension returns back to its original size uh, quicker. Uh, the key thing to have here is your extension needs to always be greater than the compression. So as you can see here, the bump, which is the compression, is lower than the extension. The extension always has to be greater than the compression. That's the one key thing you have to have. So if you're playing around with it, make sure always that extension, which is the rebound, is higher than the compression, which is the bump. It's the same for the fast value. So you can have a higher fast rebound than bump, but as you can see, the bump has to be lower than the rebound, the fast bump has to be lower than the fast rebound, because the extension has to be greater than the compression. The fast values uh, are mostly how it reacts on curbs, you know, where you hit a curb. Um, so a low fast bump, which is a soft suspension, rebound, is the same lower is softer uh, fast rebound lower fast rebound is softer higher fast rebound is stiffer uh, usually they kind of come in tandem so usually if you're going to decrease the fast bump and make that softer you tend to increase the fast rebound and make that slightly stiffer and it kind of balances it out um, quite well uh, again you don't want to exaggerate anything too much um, and thing that we see a lot is if you exaggerate too much what happens is you have way too soft suspension and the shock absorbers don't really absorb the shock that well and your wheel especially on low cars like ferraris and um, you know the, the a lot of the mid-engine cars are really low and your wheel kind of your suspension is so soft your wheel goes into the chassis and uh, if you go over a high curb it won't be your wheel that hits the curb it'll actually you'll catch the bodywork you know the side skirts the bodywork of your car on a curb which obviously sends your car spinning that's happened to several people uh, before in this community in races we've seen it before i think once at misano where someone's running a really low setup with a lot of uh, so a really soft suspension and they hit one of the little mini sausage curves and it was literally when we watched the replay it was actually the side skirt of the car that caught it because uh, they had way too soft of a suspension for dampers, this is where Motec is really good, seeing uh, Motec graphs of the dampers and um, looking at histograms of how the dampers work. Again, like I said, there's stuff out there for Motec, so if you use Motec, if you want to use Motec, I definitely recommend having a look, uh, because for dampers, uh, Motec is brilliant to get some good settings. Lastly, we move on to Aero. Aero is very important. It can make a big difference to your setting, um, to your setting, to your setup, and uh, it can be very, very important on how your car performs in qualifying and also in a race, especially in a race as well. So, first thing we look at is front aero variation, the front load variation. Um, this indicates the aerodynamic adjustment and the balance of 
whether it's to the front of the car or whether it's to uh, the rear of the car. So it shows here the base ride height is 65 rear and 60 on the front. Um, and the front aero variation is minus 4.2. So basically, if the number goes up, that means more downforce has gone to the front. So if I increase, yeah, if I increase the front ride height, you see it goes from 4.2 to 6.0. That's quite a big difference. So that means a lot more of the downforce is now being applied to the front of the car. The front of the car has a lot more downforce. If the number goes down, so if I remove, then that means more downforce is now that not more, but more than it was is being applied to the rear. If I decrease the rear, you'll see now more downforce is going to the front than it was. If I increase the rear, again, more downforce now is going to the rear. More downforce to the front. Minus 10, that means a lot of downforce is going to the front. Whereas minus 1.2, that means a lot of downforce is going to the rear. If it's a negative number, it's more to the front. If it's a uh, positive, um, it's more to the rear. Um, majority of the time, a lot of cars run with negative. As you can see here on max, even on max, it's still on negative. Uh, negative really stabilizes uh, the rear more um, when you, if you have a positive. Most cars you'll run on um, high rake like this, where you have a really low front and a really high rear. Um, however, there are certain cars where you can actually run on a um, reverse rake, where you can run like with a higher front. Um, but yeah, most uh, most cars you'll run uh, with a lower front and a higher rear. And that is uh, really what front aero variation does. Um, so really with ride height, if you lower it too far, you actually, what a lot of people think is a lower car means less drag, but it actually means um, more drag <laughs> because you want air, like you can see on this little diagram here, to go underneath the car because if more air goes underneath the car, the car is actually raised slightly, um, which means you have um, less uh, traction, which obviously means in a straight line, you want minimal traction to get maximum speed. So a car that's too low, uh, you will actually get quite a lot of drag. So you want the car to be raised a bit so that you can actually get uh, air underneath to minimize that traction. But obviously, if you want more air over the top, that's for downforce, whereas more air underneath, you want for straight line speed. Um, so what's recommended is to start with a high car, to car, start with a car that's quite raised, and then play around and get it as low as, as you can um, to get with downforce, but without impacting straight line speed too much. Again, depends on which track you're racing. Barcelona here has two straights. No, none of them are particularly that long. So I can sacrifice a bit of straight line speed um, for good cornering ability. Uh, again, you want really an aggressive high rake, uh, which is, you know, low on the front, high on the rear. Usually that is the best um, way to go with a few exceptions. With the wings, uh, now the Bentley, you can't change. Um, the rear wing, uh, the front splitter on some cars you can with the rear wing similar thing again um, if you add higher rear wing you'll add more downforce to the rear and um, this will increase the understeer and decrease oversteer make the car more stable more drag decrease the rear wing better straight line speed a bit more oversteery if you add the splitter if you increase to that a bit more oversteery um, and and makes the car more responsive um, brake ducts Basically, zero is fully closed brake ducts, and six is fully open brake ducts. Um, basically, if you have a, car, a track that has a lot of straights, um, if you have a track, uh, Paul Ricard has a huge straight, you could run with fairly closed brake ducts. Um, that will increase straight line speed because you have le um, less airflow coming through. Um, it helps with downforce as well, but obviously your brakes will overheat more, but on a track with a big straight, you have a lot of time to cool down the the brakes uh, on the big straight. If you have a corner like a track like Zolder or even Barcelona with lots of corners, you want to open these up a bit more because you want them to cool down in between the corners. You don't want them overheating. Uh, a track like this again, 40 degrees, temps like this, you want to open those brake ducts because you don't want them overheating, um, especially in a race setup where you want them to last longer. So yeah, so zero is closed, six is fully open, 
and normally you play around in the middle uh, again you very rarely use the extreme of each as you can see here right now with these break ducks and this current setting i actually have a 0.3 percent front arrow variation because of really low <laughs> rear wing um see if i add it and that will go into the minuses but you know no rear wing really high rear as you can see now a lot of downforce on the rear negative rate the back is down the front is up and it's now have more air pressure on the rear than the front normally you can't there is cars that run like this um on the bentley for example though you tend to run something more like this uh with a high rake um front down rear up and that is really going over all the settings and um i will just go back and just load the normal stock aggressive setting and we will begin our testing and to go through on what things change based on the feedback i get when i drive barcelona so here we are and with the aggressive preset so we have i haven't touched anything from the basic aggressive one uh, actually one thing i'm going to change is i'm going to put the front bricks to one um purely because uh, i'm going to be making a qualifying setup i'll show you the change i'd make uh, for an endurance set setup after um because i do have my endurance setup that i had from the previous race i'll put my fuel down to about 20 liters and uh, everything else I will keep the same and we will get going. Green light, go, go, go. So as you can see on the right hand side of uh, the screen, um, you can see my brakes are cold, so obviously I'm stood still, my tire pressure is on 25. 25.1, 26.4, 26 26.3. Um, that's obviously the temps that I set them to, and because they come pre to 70 degrees, that's what they'll be at. So let's set off and let's see how the car feels. Obviously, we have the outlap. Obviously, my brakes are quite cold. Might get some heat into them. This corner really kills the outside left tyres and Barcelona does in general because it has a lot of you know, slightly cold brakes there. I sent it a bit too deep, brakes a bit too late, where I normally would once my temps were all correct. Take this out lap nice and easy, you don't want to make any mistakes to ruin your tyres and then you have to go back in and start all over again. Just get a feel for the car. Oh, understeered a bit there. So already now, even on my outlap, there's certain things there like that understeer that I've already picked up on. Um, but I'll pick up on even more. I did my first flying lap, which I'm coming up to now. So here we go, down the straight, as you can see all my temps are pretty good. Just under 7 on the left, 27 on the left, just over 27 on the left. My brakes are cooling down now while I'm going down the straight, obviously. Apply the brakes. Understeer a lot there. And here again, look at 
so much on this day. I have to lift more than I would have wanted so I can actually get the car turned in. in the garage and as you can see here you can look at my readings uh, my canvas uh, my toe is pretty good uh, because there is uh, less than a nine degree difference here and a less than a five degree difference here but my temps are so high 96 98 100 on the inside of the left tire that's ridiculously high my tire wear it starts at three because uh, it's three uh, millimeters um, the, the, the tread depth starts at so it's on 2.9 but obviously I only did two laps uh, but as you can see even just doing two laps my tire wear on the left both tires has gone down massively um so yeah so a few changes I need to make first of all my tires are overheating like crazy now it's a really warm temp I don't want to go too low on the P uh, track I don't want to go too low on the PSI um because if I go too low then it can mess up with the tires but I think what I'm going to do is 24 on both of these and I think 25.5 on the right hand side. Uh, toe is okay at the moment, I'll keep it to minus 0.1. Um, I don't think that's, um, I need to do a bit more driving to see. Camber, now obviously a lot of negative camber is really good. Uh, but it's going to really wear my tires a lot quicker. So I'm going to push this down from minus 4 to minus 3.5, and I'm going to do minus 3.3 on the rear to minus 3, um, just so it wears my tires slightly less. Now, obviously, my car is really understeery. Front toe I didn't touch. Rear toe I'm going to make a lot more. Like I said, you can never make rear toe negative, but 0.15 is really high for me. Um, I'm going to bring it all the way down to 0.05. Um, see if that makes the car turn in better. The rear is going to be more unstable, but I think it could help the car turn in better. Electronics, TCM3, ABS on 4. Don't think I'm going to change that. That's pretty fine. Um, mechanical grip. Um, I think I'm going to soften the front anti-roll bar down to 3. Uh, brake bias on 65. I want the car to be able to turn in more understeery i can bring this all the way down i think to 62.8 maybe 63 i'll put it on 63 for now steer ratio i'll keep it on 12. uh the wheel rate and bump stop i'll keep the same the dampers i'll keep the same um the aero the brake ducts are fairly open anyway the rear is one more closed uh like i said um i didn't have a rear brake failure so maybe in the race i'd open that to uh a bit more um but for now, I'm not going to touch anything else from the aero. So all I've touched is the camber and the tire pressures and the rear toe. And I'm going to save this. You'll see I have lots of setups. So I have the CDA ones. I, I do recommend some of the CDA setups. They are very good. But I also recommend learning how to make your own setups. Uh, I like to make my own and then look at the CDA ones and compare to see if they've changed certain things that I haven't and see if that change they've made is better or not. But I do very recommend uh, 
trying to make your own because you get a better understanding of the car and how it feels and feedback yourself and it makes you a better driver if you know how it makes setups and then obviously as you can see i have the setups i had for barcelona and the race we had so this one i'm just going to call it test one and i'll save it so then when i make changes i can go back so those are the changes i'm going to make we're going to go back out on track and uh i'll see you there and we'll see how the car feels now so i'm just finishing my outlap here My tyre pressures are still a bit low, but obviously these tyres overheat super easily. Uh, but let's see how the car feels. It felt a bit better on the outlap. Turn it in for turn one. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. It turns in so much better, so much more oversteep. Um, I think you can see my delta on screen. But my delta is up by 0.4. So this setup, obviously now I can turn the car in a lot more. It's a lot better. I do I have a 2560 monitor and I've only got it uh, to 1920 by 1080. And I've gone wide and invalidated <laughs> my lap. Um, which is a shame. Bit of laps of concentration myself. Still understeers a lot of this corner. Um, but yeah, what I was saying is that I've got a 2560. Well, see, YouTube only takes 920, so I'm only recording 920. So you can see the majority of my screen, you just can't see the far left. Um, but until I made that mistake, my delta was a lot better. Uh, the car turns in a lot more. Try and make a concentrated flying lap here. Full concentration, try and get a really good lap in. Not the way to do it when you touch the sand on the exit of the final corner, but let's see. As you can see, my left hand side tyre is still overheating. I mean, on a hot track like this, it's very hard to get them not to, but we want to minimise that as much as possible. Turn one and two. Beautiful turn three. I think there's still a bit more to fix, but it doesn't understeer as much. Just with those little setup tweaks. 
So, um, yeah, I ran slightly wide on my final run on the final corner, which invalidated it. Uh, but I did get a 46.5, which is my fastest time so far. It was invalid, so it doesn't actually count, but it was just a slight mistake by myself running wide. I don't think I gained that much time. Um, so I think it's kind of valid, even though it's not. Um, as you can see, my fastest was a 30.09. I managed to do a 30.01. Here I did a 41.0. I managed to get that to a 40.7. And it was here a 35.3, and I did a 35.7. So, I, I, you know, my mistake actually running wide, I think, lost me time. Um, so, yeah, so as you can see from my first good lap, which was a 47.5 here, I did a 46.7. And now at 46.5, so I'm a second faster already. Um, obviously, I've done more laps, so the more you get into the floor, the faster you get anyway. But because the car doesn't understeer as much, it was a lot better to handle in. And the car felt a lot better in general. So it's not perfect yet. Time to make some more changes. Uh, we'll go and look into my current setup. What else do I change? So... I still feel a bit of under tier, uh, under tier, under steer. So I want to make the toe more negative. Uh, maybe not point one two two clicks there. Uh, same with the rear. I'm gonna make it full on zero. Like I said, never go negative, but I'm going as far towards the negative as I can get. The pretty much zero toe on the rear. Um, because again, I want the car, especially on that fast right hander before the back straight. I want it to turn in a lot so I can carry a lot of speed through there um the tire pressures i mean as you can see the temps are slightly better uh, i didn't get to 100 the difference between the outside and the inside is pretty good um so the temps are better i don't really want to put the pressures too much lower because um that can create a problem of its own so unfortunately with this kind of temperature you kind of have to put up with um tires that overheat slightly i might make the ca camber minus 3.3 again i'd rather more negative but maybe to look after the tires a bit more um on mechanical grip obviously i put the anti-roll bar front anti-roll bar up um to make it turn in more and um, what i should have done is also put the rear up because like i said it does the the um Re uh, the reverse actually i put it down didn't i i think it was on four two um why well, is put this one down to make it more twitchy and then put this one up um three and three uh now the car should be a bit more balanced um brake bias i think i can go a lot lower again i think 61.6 .6 maybe again more oversteery on corner entry i can brake later um I think it's uh it's good um here on the thing it's really cool to see these lines the red line uh the yellow line and the green line um because you can see exactly uh where the bump stop is what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn the wheel rate down so it's still higher than the rear wheel rate because um like i said you need stiffer at the front but i'm going to soften it a bit um so keep it uh stiffer at the front still but soften it down a bit um again softer suspension more of a steery the bentley is really good on this track it just understeers a lot so that's what i'm fixing i'm fixing the understeer making the car handle better um what next so yeah so the car's still a bit understeery and i want to make it more oversteery so i'm going to increase the bump stop rate obviously um I want to increase it to make the car more oversteery by two clicks on the front. I'm going to increase the range because I want to make the suspension softer again. Um, I think I'll double that to 10. As you can see here, see this red line, how it changes? Now it goes up because now the range is bigger than it, than it was. So obviously if I make it even bigger, you'll see it goes even higher. Um, because the, the range I'm increasing it so it's a, it's a good visual demonstration since here the range is 55 look where the red line is uh, compared to the yellow line the preload I'm going to turn down by one click again oversteer it'll open earlier kick the car in um so I think the front on a one fifteen thousand hundred fifty five hundred fifty five 155 
150,000 there. One, move that up to 1,000. Move the bump stop range to 10. Increase that. On the rear, the bump stop range is high. Do I want to change the rate? Let me, let me look at the arrow first. That'll be an important one. Arrow. So I want to open the rear more, the same as the front. Keep them cooler. Rear wing. I'm going to give it one more click up. I'm going to give the ride height the front a click up and I'm going to increase the ride height massively probably to around 80 on the rear to give it a much higher rake. Dampers I'm not going to touch for now. Um, is this it? I think this is it for now. Uh, let me save it. Over test one, resave it. Um, so I want to set the new tire set. This is if you're doing a pit stop strategy. Um, feel the same. Maybe I'll turn ABS down one so I can break slightly later. Maybe decrease the rear one. Just to make the rear softer. Not too much, by 10. Down to 45. Just because I feel it's quite a aggressive rear. Uh, save that again. Um, I might, oh. I might go to a little 61.2, not too low. Obviously wheel rate I've turned down. Boom stop rate, I might increase there. I still feel that range is a bit high. Let me bring it down to 35. Dampers, I'm not gonna touch for now. I'm gonna touch them last. Aero, I've increased the rear, increased the rear wing, open the brake looks more, increase the ride height front a tiny bit. Right, I think that is I think that is pretty much it. So we will save test one and go back out on track and let's see how the car feels. Out of the corner. That's good. Let's see what kind of lap we can put in. so much more speed. The car doesn't understeer out wide. I can put the throttle down earlier and keep the car turned in. It's all about those fast corners of Barcelona. You can carry so much speed around those if you have a car with minimal understeer. And all the best overtaking opportunities on the straights. A lot of the straights, before the straights. And the fast right hand, and I'm gonna go wide and probably divide the lap time, which is a frustrating thing to do because I'm on such a good lap right now. Almost a second faster. And if it wasn't for my own human error, this would have been a good lap. What a lap it would have been. It would have been a 145 point something. My left tire is obviously overheating still. A 145.7 it would have been if I didn't validate it. Let's try to do that again without invalidating it. But my brakes cool down on the straights really well now, the more open brake does. That turn one, turn two, lift on turn three earlier, 
back on the power. I can keep the car turned in so well. My delta shoots up there by being just green to being green by 0.3. Just because I fixed that understeer issue. Now I messed that up myself a bit, but hopefully we'll make up the time for that mistake. It was actually faster than my other one, mate. That's the best. So that's a good lap. And again, from the stock aggressive setup to the first one we made, we gained a whole second pretty much. And from the second one we made to this one, another whole second we gained. Oh, my tyres, massive snap of over steer. That's that done. My tyres are just overheating massively. Tyres are a big problem. Um, I've got a car that's brilliant for qualifying right now, but needs a bit of tweaking if I was going to use it in a race. Um, based on uh, how the tyres, especially on the left-hand side, are doing in this ridiculous temperature. But we return to garage, and that is a brilliant car. Now, there is probably a couple tweaks I can make here and there um, to make it even better. I think that's beautiful. This setup is brilliant. Uh, this is great. Uh, obviously, this I think is pretty good. Again, I think I can bring this down um, from stop range to 25. Just stiffen that rear a tiny bit more. Um, uh, just, just because we have so much oversteery that I could feel the car was a bit soft on the rear. Dampers, like I said, they're the best when you have the Motec data and the histograms to look at. And um, obviously I don't have that right now. So I'm not gonna touch the dampers. A lot of the time you don't need to, you can make a good set without touching them. Um, the rear, I might just add a bit more rake, maybe 85 on the rear. The rear wing at eight, I think that was pretty good. Um, let me save that. And I think, to me, this is a good setup I've done. I think this setup is fantastic. Um, I think it's brilliant. Uh, if I look at the timetables, 29.7, where, well, let's compare. So my first with the stock aggressive setup was a 30.4. Then when I did some changes, uh, where was it, my invalid lap, this one. 30.0, so I gained 0.4 in the first sector. 29.7, so brilliant, brilliant there. Then it was 41.3 in the second, and it went to a 40.7, and then now a 40.6, so I gained 0.1 in the middle sector there. And it was a 35.7, went to a 35.7, didn't change. We've now put it down in the last sector to a 35.3. That That is much better. So as you can see, the most time gained was in the first, and it's mostly that fast right-hander turn three. My car was understeering out, so if I put the throttle down too early, my car was just drifting out wide that way and have to lift, whereas now the car can stay turned in. It's not as understeery, more oversteer, but I can stay turned in. I stiffened the rear suspension a bit, changed the preload diff and the, increased the rear anti-roll bar, and that got me more speed on the final. Do you know that final little section? It's quite a tricky. You can make or break your lap. The little chicane, the left, right. Um, that that bit there, that's 
what's increased there on the rear to get a 45.7. Now, I can go a lot faster than that. I know I can do 44s. Um, so we've made those last little tweaks, and we're going to go back out. And let's see if we can do a 44 somewhere. Um, if we can do a 44, Low tire pressure. Stay then away I think groups. this is a very good set. Well, after lots of trying, uh, unfortunately, I just... I couldn't get a, uh, I couldn't get a good lap together, um, as you can see by my purple lap times being in three different laps. Um, I just couldn't get one where it all came together. Um, I think the temperature didn't help, you know, how high the tyres are, but I think this setup that we have is pretty good. Um, I think it, I think it works well. A bit oversteery, so if you want a more stable car, um, then obviously you can uh, decrease, you know, things like the bump stop and increase the brake bias a bit. Um, and fiddle with the aero to make it more, but I think this setup is pretty good. Now, if I was going to turn it into a race setup, what I would probably do is make the camber especially on the left side um less negative purely just to um look after the tires a bit more i think my pressures even though my tires were overheating the pressures never really got to 27 so i think the the pressures could go to 24.5 actually on the left um as you can see the temps just really <laughs> rocketing it's very hard on a track at this temp uh, i think in a race i'd probably put abs to five maybe tc to four uh obviously I'd, if it was an endurance ra race like a like the 2.4 uh hour race we did i'd probably see, put that up obviously high fuel um maybe slightly high brake bias to 62 and i think that would be pretty much all I would change for the race just to make the tires last longer and then if I load the one we used for the race 82 so reduce the ride height by one click kept the no wonder my rear brake ducks failed uh, I had it on two probably should have run off three now like I said the temperature wasn't as high it was 27 so whereas on here I'd, if this was the temperature for the race I'd probably run it like this or even this um Whereas on this race, I ran it like that. Probably should have run them both on three. Um, dampers, 10, 15, 26, 29. I think that's pretty similar to the race, the quality setup. Um, this is exactly the same as the quality setup. So no difference there. Um, now you can see 100 litres of fuel with the pit strategies we had and everything. Electronics, three and three still. I ran at and slightly higher temps uh camber minus 3.3 .3, minus 3 slightly higher toe so the car wasn't as twitchy during the race so obviously i put that down to 0, 0.00 and qualifying and in the one we just did where it's around it it's not 0.06 um so yeah so there you are so that's the setups that i actually made myself that i spent more time i spent more time than i just did now uh making and quite similar apart from a few changes here and there to the one I just did it. But I think, like I said, do what I do, take an aggressive, take it around, change a few things, save it, take it around, change a few things, save it, take it around. And I hope that this video helped. I hope the explanation of what everything means helped. And uh, one thing I'll leave in the description is a link one of uh, members of our community left us is the Driver61. And it's really a link to show on if you have understeer or if you have oversteer this is what you should change this is what you should change uh, and it's a very useful guide to follow uh, so i'll leave that in the link so you guys can download it um uh, just open it on a web um tab um so yeah so you know knowing vital things i mean even knowing like oversteer and understeer what it means understeer is not having enough grip on the front oversteer is not having enough grip on the rear oversteer is where the back of the car likes to swing around and you end up spinning understeer is where you want to go to the right but you keep going more straight and more turning um so yeah just knowing what everything is knowing what everything means knowing how to take feedback through the wheel of how things feels 
is crucial to setting up a good setup. So hopefully this helped you guys. Hopefully I'll see some of the guys that watch this video in our community. We're open for beginners. Um, we have a wide range of, um, we have a wide variety of uh, different range of talent, you know, from beginners to people that are really quick. Um, we run several classes. Uh, we run an endurance league at the moment um, where we want more teams to join. So if you would like to race in endurance races with a teammate, if you want to find a teammate, then join our community, uh, say hello, and uh, hopefully we will see you on track. And I hope this video was really helpful and uh, I'll see you next time.